Hello and welcome to ECTV. I'm Ryan and today we have a special interview where Zion talks with Dana Joya. Dana is the California State Poet Laureate. He was head of the National Endowment for the Arts under President Bush, where he started programs such as Poetry Out Loud and The Big Read. We caught up with Dana at the Thousand Oaks Library as part of his Poet Laureate Initiative to visit every county in California. He is presently teaching at USC. And now to Zion. Hello, my name is Zion Reza, and today I'm here at the Thousand Oaks Library with California's Poet Laureate and Professor at USC, Dana Joya. Today we'll be discussing all things poetry. Thank you for being here today. I'm glad to be here. So my first question for you is, um, you mentioned in your essay, um, Can Poetry Matter? How new novels and biographies are reviewed by newspapers almost immediately after publication, while new poems um, are often delayed or, or never reviewed at all. So why do you think that is? Well, there's two reasons. I mean, first of all, I think that when ma magazines and newspapers review books, some of it's a commercial enterprise. They're reviewing the books that will sell, that will advertise in their uh, publications, et cetera, et cetera. And poetry essentially doesn't make money. It exists outside of the economy. But I think even more importantly is that you know, poetry has gone from being something that was part of general culture to something that's now part of specialist culture. Editors don't think it'll interest their readers. What role does contemporary poetry play in academic settings today? Well, it's, it depends. Uh, I mean, what's unusual now is that until quite recently, when you studied poetry in school, you studied the poetry of the past. Mm -hmm. Now you're just as likely to study a poem that's written last year. I'm not altogether sure that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you, what you want to put in your, in your education are poems that have withstood the test of time. I mean, I think it's good to mix a few new poems in, but you really should try to uh, acquaint students with the tradition that's, that pr has produced poetry, the poems that have survived for a century or two. Yeah, I noticed in your essay you actually mentioned the Norton, um, Norton Reader. Norton Anthology. Norton yeah. Anthology. Yeah, I actually studied that all last year in AP English. It was like, I think it was junior year English, and there were a lot of like modern day poems, but they're also like mixture of, you know, ancient or, you know, not so recent times yeah. poems. So that was interesting to have that. Well, you know, I'm so old fashioned that yeah. I, I think it's not a bad idea to do things chronologically, right. just so that you know what came first and what mm -hmm. came then and then and then and then. Because I, I think for my students, they really have very little idea of history. Right. You know, they live in a, a kind of perpetual present tense. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's a weakness intellectually. Mm -hmm. So poetry is incredibly romanticized. You even refer to it as a literary commodity um, run by editors and reviewers for tradition's sake. So can you elaborate on how this kind of happened? Well, it's very complicated, but uh, you know, when I say, you know, when poetry is romanticized, what they romanticize is the role of the poet, not the poem itself. I mean, if you look in movies, the poet is either a romantic figure or a comical figure, you know. You, usually the poet comes in, the poet's going to be uh, impractical. You know, what happened is a couple of things. About a hundred years ago, you know, poets began in a sense to try to define themselves as against the center of society, uh, as outsiders, and they created a language that was largely written for other poets. And I think it's, there's a real difference between if I'm trying to write a poem that uh, involves other people or if I'm trying to write a poem that's just going to be speaking to other poets. Mm -hmm. It takes you in two different directions, and if you spend a hundred years going in each direction, the, the art becomes quite uh, something different from what traditional poetry is. Mm -hmm. To me, the, the main task of poets today is to reconnect with an audience. How do you reconnect with a wider audience without dumbing things down, without condescending to anyone? So I noticed you encourage performance over too much analysis with, you know, especially with high school and undergraduate students. Um, what are some qualities in performance not found in soul analysis? Well, if you think about this, what a poem is is a special kind of language. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's a, a sort of language that goes all the way back to the beginning of humanity. And it speaks to the, you in the totality of your humanity which is a person with a mind, with the emotions, with physical senses, with a physical body, with memories, intuition, imagination. And poetry, in fact, all art does not 
ask you to divide those things into separate categories of perception. Uh, and so you, if you hear a poem or you recite a poem, you're experiencing it as a whole human being. When you analyze a poem, you're putting your these things to, to one side and you're looking at it intellectually. What analysis means, you know, in terms of the root uh, of the word, is you break things apart into pieces so that you can understand them. Uh, what performance does is put them back together as a whole. And it's interesting, I, my sense is that m very few people like to analyze poems. You know, once they get going, they might find it interesting, yeah. but you know, you don't see students going, great, I get to write a paper <laughs> analyzing this poem. But if you, get, if you perform poems for people, they like them. You know, they can experience them. Even if they don't like the poem, they know what to do with the experience. And I think that about a hundred years ago, when they started teaching poetry differently, when they went from performance and memorization uh, into analysis and sort of written uh, uh, critical statements, they lost the audience. And so you know, things like Poetry Out Loud is a way of, in a sense, reestablishing you know, a, a kind of traditional connection to poetry. So kind of like going off of that Poetry Out Loud, um, this was that sort of notion of performance over analysis, was it kind of an inspiration for Poetry Out Loud? Well, yeah, well, well, yes and no. I, I was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, and I felt that one of the major problems in American education, and you might even say it is the major problem in American education, is they had taken the arts out of schools. And it's largely because they couldn't afford it and they didn't know how to do it. So you have a whole generation of people basically going through uh, high school, going through middle school, going through elementary school without connection with the arts. And it's bad in two ways. I mean, one is, are you really educating someone uh, if you're not educating their imagination, their emotions, uh, uh, their intuition, especially in, a, you know, in an increasingly creative environment? Uh, secondly, uh, when people actually can come and take a music class, a drama class, an art class, and it's been proven, attendance improves. You know, we, about one third out of American students drop out of high school. Uh, it you know, pretty much uh, puts limits on the rest of their lives. And as a way of, in a sense, both educating them and, and making them want to come to school, I thought it was important. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, it's extraordinarily expensive to do a band program, a theater program. So we began thinking, what arts program could we bring nationally, immediately, at very little money? Because what we had was very little money. Mm -hmm. And we developed the idea of a poetry performance program. And then we got the idea of doing it in competition, and that became Poetry Out Loud. We started you know, with just two cities, and a year later we went national, and now it's, it's a, really a part of the high school curriculum in, in many places. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, you are definitely. <laughs> yeah, because my school, my high school itself, is incredibly small, yeah. so we don't, we don't really have that funding for you know, all these different arts programs and everything. So what was really like, interesting and, and kind of beautiful in Poetry Out Loud is that you don't need that much. You just need that person, you need their poem, you need their, their ambient sort of. Yeah, what, you, what you need really is one teacher mm -hmm. who is really likes the idea, and then maybe one outside volunteer. What's been, not, what's been really good about Poetry Out Loud is that, you know, across California at least, which is the state I know the best, a lot of local poets have become involved. And you know, it gives them a chance, in a sense, to bring their art to more people. And it's also something that happens, and I didn't really fully realize this until I'd, you know, I'd been traveling around the state as Poet Laureate. What you create in a lot of cases is an intergenerational dialogue. A lot of kids, basically, the only adults they know outside of their family are their teachers. And you know, these communities are stratified by age. And uh, you know, what you see in, in Poetry Out Loud is a lot of older poets working with high school students, and it creates something in addition to the poetry, it creates a kind of intergenerational relationship, dialogue. I think that's good for society. I agree. Um, so poetry itself is deeply rooted in history, even um, taking on pib like biblical personalities. Um, in what other ways does poetry connect with every society? Well, if you if you talk to an anthropologist, uh, you'll learn that there's they've never found a society which doesn't have poetry. You know, poetry goes back to the very origins of human society. Poetry is is developed and perfected before writing comes along. 
because people need a special kind of language that they can deal with the most important issues. So, you know, if you, you know, if you look at it, usually the religious texts of most societies are written, you know, in poetry, in verse. Uh, you know, the Bible, the Old Testament, the Koran, the Vedas, uh, and, you know, and it's a way of, in a sense, preserving those things which are considered uh, precious. I mean, w uh, Robert Frost once said, poetry is a way of remembering what it would impoverish us to forget. And I think that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's memory, it's a method, and it's about those things which are, you know, are our wealth. Without them, we're impoverished. So if you look at this, you know, we have this relationship of poetry that goes back to the origins of humanity, and it continues very strongly. About a hundred years ago, it begins to change in a very weird way. And I think when, when poetry loses an audience, poetry is a diminished thing. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting how you motioned that poetry should be mixed with classical or jazz music um, and listened to on the radio. Uh, how and why did poetry take on this role of an oral medium, as you call it? Well, you know, if you think about this, poetry goes back to a point in human history where you didn't have it. I mean, it, anything you did, you had to do with the human body. Mm -hmm. So people danced, they sang, they told stories, and all three of those things, you know, uh, involve rhythm, the rhythm of, of the body. And, you know, our body has its own rhythms. I mean, you know, people say, Shakespeare blank verse is da dump, da dump, da dump, da dump. You know, to be or not to be, that is, but that's true on one hand, but it's also, we have rhythms in our body, and the rhythms of poetry, the rhythms of music, the rhythms of dance create this connection. It's a physical connection, it's not intellectual. This is what we lose in analysis, and you feel your way through it. And so, what, what you know, people would, would created this medium because they had to find a way of having, making people listen. Because everybody's talking all the time in a family, everybody's talking to everybody else, and you've heard it all before. Mm -hmm. So you develop a, you know, a method. My father perfected a method of not hearing anything my, my mother said, because my mother was talking to him all the time. You know? And so he, he lived in inner peace while my mother was talking to him. Uh, and most people in families develop that. Uh, and so what poetry does is a way of sort of luring you into listening through pleasure, you know, through physical sensation. And it's a vessel for you know, that which we think is precious. And it's the same thing as song. If you go back to ancient society, song and poetry is the same thing. They have the same word for a song as a poem. So how does that mesh with oral tradition? Well, it's all, all oral because nothing was written. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you didn't have anything to write down. You'd had, yeah. There was no recording tech. You know, I mean, think about this. Poetry is the first memory technology. You know, it's the silicon chip you know, thousands of years before the silicon chip is invented. Because if you had to remember it, you had to put it to a beat. You had to put it to a tune. And, and so it's all oral. And what happened is that in the 19th century, when people are basically, you know, now reading everything in books, uh, poetry becomes silent. And when poetry becomes silent, it loses a lot of the, the audience. Now we're in a society which is largely an oral society, television, cell phones, radio, recordings. And so poetry actually is an art form that's much more contemporary than the, those forms of silent reading. So it's, a, it's not a bad time to be a poet. Yeah. Believe it or not. <laughs> um, so that's interesting because slam poetry and uh, performance is steadily you know, among the rise uh, with youth. So how is slam reviving classic poetry's diminishing popularity, well, well, would you, you say? If you think well, diminishing popularity. Well, well if, you, if you think about this, you know, I've been saying this for about 20 years, mm -hmm. and finally people are agreeing with me, which means I'm probably wrong now. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most important thing that's happened in American poetry over the last 30 years was invented entirely outside of the English department. Suddenly, all, you know, if you go back 40 years ago, all the poets are English teachers, are working in universities and colleges. They're doing it in a certain way. And poetry becomes smaller and quieter and more inward looking. Some people wrote very well, but it's, it became a very much of a specialist art. Meanwhile, you take away poetry from ordinary people, they reinvent it. 
it may take them a generation or two. So suddenly, in completely unconnected ways, people who had nothing at all to do uh, with the English department, people that weren't welcome in the university, they invent hip hop, uh, you know, in the South Bronx. They invent poetry slams in, bar, in the bars of Chicago. They revive cowboy poetry in Elko, Nevada. Poets in, you know, my generation, in, in, in the new formalists, we reinvent rhyme, meter, narrative. Uh, and the English departments attacked us. But you know what, hap what those things all have in common is it's about poetry being spoken and heard aloud. You can shape it you know, uh, tightly or you can shape it loosely, but it's about poetry as performance. And the other thing, if you think about oral poetry, which makes it different from written poetry, is that the, the creator and the audience share a space. So there's, there's a proximity between the two of them. It's a direct relationship versus publishing a poem and then 20 years later somebody 3,000 miles away reading it in silence. That's good too, don't get me wrong, but it's very different from in a sense sharing the space with the people at a particular time in a particular place. So I understand you're also the Judge Whitney Professor of Poetry and Public Culture at USC in Los Angeles. They had to call me something. <laughs> yeah, um, so can you tell me a little bit about what you teach and what the class is like and how does it relate to poetry and public culture? Well, USC uh, wanted to hire me and, and I, I've not wanted academic jobs generally. I think it's better to earn your living as a writer or have another job and write. That's, that's my preference. It's a, obviously a minority preference. Uh, but when I was coming back to California after nearly a decade in Washington, D.C., you know, I'm from L.A. originally. You know, like, like today, today's reading, my 93-year-old uncle's going to be here. That's why I'm in Thousand Oaks, because I want my Uncle Jack, Uncle Giacomo, uh, Giacomo Dragato, uh, you, know, to, you, know, to, you know, to be there. And so I wanted to, I thought maybe it would be interesting to come back to L.A., because I'm from here, my wife's from here. Our, fam, you know, our family's kind of scattered, but we, I, we have more family here than anywhere else. And so I, I, I told the U.S. I, I would consider teaching, but I didn't want to be in just one department. I didn't want to teach just one subject. And so they had, to, they had to figure out what I was. And so I said, call me the, uh, a professor of poetry and public culture. About poetry, we know what that is. But public culture is the notion that art and culture is for people. It's not for professors. It's about, in a sense, enriching the life of a community, enriching the lives of students, enriching you know, uh, the lives of a university. And so we invented a title. I'm the only poet, uh, professor of poetry and public culture in the world. You know? <laughs> Although I hope there will be more. So what I'm teaching at USC is, uh, are three classes. I teach an introduction to poetry. It's called The Art of Poetry. I've got 200 students in it uh, you know, this semester. And I'm trying to take students and teach them how to experience a poem but, and, and how to read and think about poetry. And I also make them memorize and recite poems. Because, you know, and I think what I'm trying to do is to bring poetry into their lives early enough where it becomes part of their personal formation. That's why I want to teach undergraduates, not graduates. There's much more prestige to teach graduate students. Frankly, it's easier. You know, I got 200, you know, people that are engineering majors and you know, uh, science majors and theater people and music people. It's a mob. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know, I want to bring them what I think is valuable. And then I teach a graduate class called Arts Leadership and Arts Entrepreneurship. It's about running arts organizations and also for artists who want to pursue something and they can't, and they can't find a job, how to create an organization which basically is the, uh, fulfills the objective of what they want to do. So, you know, create a string quartet an orchestra, you know, a theater group, a dance group, and how you do it. And then I teach another graduate class for singers, composers, and musicians called Words and Music. And we look how uh, poetry is used in song, in opera, in sacred works, uh, and uh, you know, part of the class is creative. I have the composers in the class write song cycles for the singers and musicians to perform. So the final is a concert. Very interesting. So it's a very strange yeah. <laughs> portfolio of classes. Yeah. And I do that all in the fall semester, and then I, in the spring I go up to Northern California and hide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. It's really an honor. Thank you for wanting to talk to me. That's an honor too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're glad to have you. Thanks, Dana and Zion. It is important that we continue to cultivate all forms of art, even the ones that are beyond money. We'll see you next time on ECTV. Yeah.